Hello folks, welcome to CS412 Software Security. This is the speedrun of OX03 security policies. Today we will cover a couple of basic concepts. We'll repeat the core concepts that we had in our very first introductory class, namely isolation, least privilege and compartmentalization, but then dive into the core policies that will kind of occupy us throughout the, a large part of the, the course. And it's always essential to know the basic policies well to understand what can actually happen if you violate them. Therefore, in this class, we will learn and understand how memory safety and type safety apply to systems programming and also give a couple of examples on how these security policies can be uh, violated as part of the, the process. A policy is a deliberate system of principles to guide decisions and achieve rational outcomes. A policy is a statement of intent and is implemented as a procedure or a protocol, right? So we, we've already discovered and covered certain policies in the last couple of classes. Today we will focus on like recapping some of these basic policies and principles from before, but then also defining two of the core policies software uh, in software security, namely memory safety and type safety. Now let's recap the, the three principles uh, that we have already discussed before. First one, isolation. And here with isolation, the goal is to isolate and separate two components from each other. Uh, the goal here is that one component cannot access data or code of the other component, except through this well-defined API that we as security researchers will clearly uh, review, layout, and enforce, right? So an example would be a user space application may only access the disk through the file system API, as in the operating system will prohibit direct block access to raw data to ensure that the process can only access files that it should be allowed to access. Therefore, the operating system isolates the user space uh, process from the disk. Um, isolation incurs overhead due to switching costs between components. As in, in the example above, you will incur switching costs and overhead whenever you switch from user space to the operating system to check the privileges and to separate these two parts. Uh, the second core principle is the principle of least privileges. And this principle ensures that a component has the least amount of privileges needed to function. If you would remove any further privilege, would, it would reduce the functionality. If you would add any privilege, it will not increase the functionality, at least according to the specification. Uh, this property constrains the attacker in the obtainable privileges, as in it limits what the attacker can actually do. Of course, this requires isolation. If, the, uh, if one of the privileges would be to just adding privileges, this wouldn't work. Uh, one example here is that Chrome or Chromium separates uh, rendering into an encapsulatable sandbox with only the minimum set of system calls. So the sandbox runs with the least amount of, uh, of privileges that, uh, that are actually possible. And these are only read, write, exit, uh, close, and then return. Fault compartments are the final uh, final example. Here is uh, the, the concept that we separate individual components into the smallest possible functional unit and these units then contain faults. Whenever something bad happens, it's only the compartment that will fail, but not the, the rest of the system. And this allows abstraction permission checks at the boundaries from a, from a so-called security monitor that will then evaluate how the system is going. And the system uh, the security monitor only needs to step in whenever the boundary is being crossed, but not whenever there's, uh, there's some computation happening inside the compartment itself. Uh, this principle builds on least privilege and isolation, and both properties are most effective in combination. Many small components that are running and interacting with least privileges. And the example that we, that we looked at is QMail or the Chromium rendering process from before. Uh, an interesting aspect that we'll discuss later on is uh, a confused deputy, which still is a problem. As in, if you can get a compartment to act on your behalf, then it's almost as if you had the privilege from the, the uh, compartment that you are abusing yourself. 
right? So this is a confused step. We can talk a bit more about this later on in the in the class. Now let's look at the the two main um, policies that we want to discuss today, namely memory safety and type type safety. And let's start with with memory safety. So memory safety is a property that ensures that during the execution of a program, all memory accesses adhere to the semantics defined by the source programming language. And this requires us to, um, to kind of ensure that the, there's, there's no bad, uh, bad interactions possible so that you cannot step outside of the, the specifications of the source programming language, right? And the absence of memory safety would allow any kind of arbitrary uh, execution to happen by the by an attacker, right? So as we are pushing towards practical memory safety, uh, we want to define some strict notion and definition of tangible memory safety and how this applies to low-level programming languages. And there, there is a gap between the operational semantics of the programming language itself and the underlying instructions that are provided by the ISA, which allow an attacker to, to kind of bypass restrictions imposed by the programming language and then access memory safety out of context. So for example, if we have a, a small program here written by Alice, who writes a log function, uh, and then there, there's a function pointer being taken uh, that is being initialized and being called during during different kind of uh, initialization routines, right? So there's no bug in the code itself, right? Uh, so this code itself is is fine, but there may be attacks happening uh, later on. Now, as this is being compiled to, uh, to to native code or to assembly, this will be mapped to a to a low level representation, and as it is being compiled bugs may be exposed or, or may become exploitable in, in different ways. Now, interestingly, as there's a, a bug in another component written by, by Alice's coworker, some of her code may be exploited due to the violation of specification in this other code. But interestingly, as we are moving between the two layers of abstraction, we are not following the semantics of the high-level programming language, in this case, the systems language C or C++, but we're actually following the semantics as an attacker of the underlying programming language. So we are not using these, these high-level bricks that we have in the source programming language, but we are using the low-level bricks we have in the, the systems model on the right-hand side. So the attacker, when writing an exploit, will actually use the assembly instructions, but not the high-level C and C++ code on the, on the left-hand side. So the bug happens on the right-hand side, and the attacker will abuse the properties of the machine that is being specified on the right-hand side and not the one on the left-hand side. Memory unsafe languages like C or C++ cannot enforce memory safety themselves. Uh, data accesses can occur through stale or illegal pointers and thereby resulting in uh, memory unsafety. The issue here is that C allows arbitrary unchecked pointer arithmetics with an anything goes type system that allows arbitrary costs as well. So C fundamentally trusts the programmer and the programmer can adjust a pointer to a memory object in an arbitrary way that may be illegal, right? And go beyond the, the memory object or may even, uh, a pointer may, may reference a memory object that has been freed before. So in, the, the, in systems languages like C and C++, the programmer is responsible for memory safety. Therefore, uh, the, any kind of, of uh, memory checks that are being forgotten or, or kind of missed may result in security issues. The reason here is that performance is key, right? The C system or the, the C programming language only carries out the checks that are actually added by the programmer. Therefore, this results in the best possible performance uh, if the programmer never adds bugs or, or in, inserts bugs, of course. Now there's a difference between a bug and a vulnerability and we already hinted at this 
in, in previous classes. A vulnerability is a bug that can be reached and triggered through attacker controlled input. So every vulnerability is a bug, but not every bug is a vulnerability. So vulnerabilities are the subset of the, of the bugs that can actually be reached and triggered through the attacker or by the attacker. The attacker thereby prepares a certain input that causes the program's control flow to actually reach the, the bug location and therefore uh, the trigger it with the attacker specified input. Every memory safety violation in, in a program is a bug, but a bug whose input can be controlled by the attacker is a vulnerability. And then this obviously depends on the, the goals of the attacker uh, the, and based on the, on the threat model, what the severity of the, the vulnerability will be. Now, memory safety by itself is a general property that can apply to a program, a runtime environment, or a programming language. And I really enjoyed Mike's Hicks uh, specification and uh, kind of discussion on memory safety. And I really encourage you to read the, the set of blog posts that he wrote around memory safety. Now, memory safety fundamentally prohibits and protects against buffer overflows, null point to dereferences, use up to free vulnerabilities or use of un uninitialized memories or even double frees. Um, and then a program is memory safe if all possible executions of the program are memory safe. So we have this for all quantifier here. Uh, a runtime environment is memory safe if all runnable programs are memory safe. So, uh, and last but not least, uh, programming language is memory safe if all expressible programs are memory safe, right? So the, there's a, an increasing level of sof sophistication here. The program is memory safe if all possible executions for all possible inputs are memory safe, right? So this means the, the program itself is memory safe if there is no input that will violate memory safety. A runtime environment is memory safe if there is no possible program that violates memory safety. And a programming language is uh, memory, memory safe if, all, uh, if no single expressible programs will violate memory safety. Right, so these are the four, uh, the th sorry, the three layers here. And requir requirements for memory safety from a C, C++ view are the follows. Right, it depends on two steps. First, a pointer goes out of bounds or becomes dangling, and then the pointer is dereferenced. Uh, and with dereference, we mean it is either, either used for reading or writing. Um, so the pointer can go out of bounds by through pointer arithmetics, or it become da becomes dangling if the underlying memory object has been freed. And this kind of separates the view of memory safety into spatial memory safety and temporal memory safety. Now, spatial memory safety is a property that ensures that all memory objects and uh, all memory dereferences are within the bounds of their pointers valid objects. Uh, an object's bounds are defined when the object is allocated. So whenever you allocate a memory object through the runtime system, the, the according lower address and upper address is defined. And this is the, the valid memory object. Any computer pointer to that object inherits the bounds of the object, right? So if you assign a pointer, then that pointer becomes, uh, gets the same base and max address of the, the original object. Any pointer arithmetic can only result in a pointer inside the same object. Pointers that point outside of their associated object may not be dereferenced, otherwise they would violate spatial memory safety. Dereferencing such illegal pointers uh, is undefined behavior and results in the spatial memory safety error. Now, let's give an example of what a sp spatial memory uh, safety violation would actually look like. And we've got this simple program here. We've got a, a pointer, we allocate 24 bytes to it. So it's a memory object of 24 bytes that a pointer points to. And then we iterate through this array and then just write the, the characters uh, from A to, uh, to 24, 25 to it, right? So uh, we write the first set of characters in there um, and 
unfortunately we iterate from 0 to 24 inclusive so you're actually accessing the memory one byte past its bound and this would result in a spatial memory safety violation right because we've been iterating through the memory object accessing each individual uh, byte of memory and then increasing this memory by one now temporal memory safety on the other hand looks at temporal aspects in, uh, compared to spatial aspects from before and temporal memory safety is a is a property that ensures that all memory dereferences are valid at the time of the dereferences as in the, the pointed to object is the same and remains the same as when the pointer was created so there was no change in in pointer uh, in, 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 in the underlying object while the pointer was live. When an object is freed, the underlying memory is no longer associated to the object and the pointer is no longer valid. Dereferencing such an invalid pointer results in a temporal memory safety error and is also undefined behavior as according to the C, C++ language specification. Now let's look at an example that violates temporal memory safety. And these are just simple examples to get you uh, a bit on, uh, like to, to give you a very simple um, overview of what these, these kind of memory safety errors could be. Here again, we allocate uh, an, uh, an object of 26, uh, 26 bytes and we write the letters A to Z into it. But this time we actually have the, the right size. But unfortunately, we free the object before it is actually uh, being used, right? Before we actually write to the memory object. And after freeing the memory object, the, the pointer becomes invalid and can no longer be used in, uh, in anything uh, reasonable, right? Therefore, accessing the, the bytes below by writing the, the letters A to Z to it results in temporal memory safety violations. Now, given that we have the two examples of spatial and temporal memory safety, let's push towards the definition of memory safety. So memory safety is violated if undefined memory is accessed. Uh, memory is undefined if it is either out of bounds or deallocated, right? These are the two stages or two uh, kind of sources of undefined memory. Uh, therefore, like if we, if we look at memory safety this way, then pointers become capabilities, right? Each pointer is a capability that allows access to a well-defined region of allocated memory. And a pointer is no longer just an address, but an actual tuple of address, lower bound, upper bound, and its validity. And just for, for implementation, instead of the upper bound, you could also store the, the lower bound and the size, right, as an example. Any kind of pointer arithmetic would update the tuple and memory allocation or deallocation would update the, the validity. Any kind of dereference would check the capability and make sure that the pointed to memory object is still valid. Um, capabilities in here, they are imp implicitly added and enforced by the compiler if we would uh, ensure memory safety, right? For this, for this hypothetical systems programming language. Capability-based memory safety enforces type safety for two types, right? So this gives us a form of type safety for pointer types and scalars, right? So we don't have any kind of distinction between individual types except for pointer types and scalars. Uh, pointers and their capabilities are only created in a safe way and pointers can be dereferenced if, uh, if they point to their assigned still valid region, okay? So far, so good. So let's look at a couple of examples for, for memory safety or memory safe languages. In Java, uh, Java uses a, a, is a programming language that enforces memory safety. And instead of giving developers pointers that allow them to reference raw memory, they are being replaced with references. So uh, um, the, the developers will leverage references that actually point to objects and they don't point to, to raw memory. Uh, so there's no way to free data. The garbage collector will uh, periodically scan the, the heap and then reclaim any kind of, of memory that is no longer be, be used and reclaim any kind of objects that are no longer being referenced. 
the language and the runtime system enforce the, the memory safety and type safety for the system. But this comes at a, at a certain overhead, right? And people believe that it's, it's about 40, 50 percent of overhead. But the, 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 num the number or the amount of overhead varies a lot depending on what kind of, uh, of, of program you will be implementing. Uh, so the just-in-time compiler and the Java runtime system has become quite good at optimizing most, uh, most code. Uh, another example is Rust. This is a, a recent systems language, systems programming language, that brings a strict type system and owner, uh, ownership that enforces uh, a strong version of, of memory safety. References are bound to individual variables and the clear ownership protects against different kinds of data races. So there's only a single mutable reference or zero or more immutable references. And interestingly, as soon as variables go out of scope, they're being reclaimed. And this is a, an interesting zero cost abstraction towards memory safety that the, the compiler can check for during compilation and then at runtime, there's very few checks that actually have to be, be added. So Rust results in a, in a very fast and efficient, co uh, efficient binary that runs almost as fast as, as native execution or up to as fast as native execution. Now, how can we enforce memory safety for C and C++? And what makes C and C++ actually memory unsafe? What kind of properties, what kind of features? So there's a bunch of things we can, we can do to increase the, the security properties. We can formally prove the safety of a, of a program, but this may not scale. We can remove unsafe features in C and C++ through a, through a dialect and then potentially need to rewrite the code, or we can protect the use of unsafe features through a form of instrumentation. Um, we will not go into too much depth about formal verification. I'll refer you to, to respective courses on that, but we'll focus on the, the latter two points, removing unsafe features and protecting the use of unsafe features. So let's look into dialecting first, right? So, uh, an example of research that implements memory safety for C and C++ through dialects is Cyclone, where uh, C and C++ are extended with safe pointers that then enforce uh, a strict set of safety rules during compilation, right? So Cyclone is a system that brought memory safety to, uh, to C. And the idea is to limit pointer arithmetic, add explicit null checks, and then use garbage collection for heap and region lifetimes for the stack to ensure that uh, pointers cannot escape and become dangling, therefore protecting against temporal memory safety. For unions, another, set of, another feature that may result in, in type issues, the conversions are being restricted and um, extended. And in addition, the pointers are kind of um, replaced through never null and fed pointers whenever necessary. So as a baseline um, for uh, the system will use fat pointers that are address based in size whenever needed and whenever they escape. And then the, the compiler may optimize and use either never null or regular pointers if it can prove that all the uses of the, the pointer are safe. Uh, and the set jump feature is replaced through exceptions and polymorphism. So this dialect will both implement spatial and temporal memory safety for C at the cost of having to rewrite parts of the system and uh, potential um, runtime overhead of this, this system. Now, this requires rewriting all software and may come at a, at a certain cost, especially if you're looking at rewriting large software systems like the Linux kernel or Chrome to these kind of dialects. This would incur a massive amount of overhead and require a substantial effort on the, on the programmer's behalf. Therefore, um, memory safety through instrumentation is an interesting alternative to this. If we instrument C and C++ programs, uh, without changing the underlying uh, source code, we need to make sure that all the accesses are always safe and keep additional information about the program as we go along. 
because in C and C++, we don't have sufficient amount of information about the memory objects and pointers to do these checks. We therefore need additional information about that. Right, so we must track either the pointers or the allocated memory. We need to associate this information either with the pointers themselves, with each individual pointer, or with each allocated memory object. And then when we dereference data, we need to check the pointer validity whenever it is dereferenced. So this can be either object-based, which will store information for each memory object, which cannot detect sub-object overflows, um, and there's going to be overhead for large lookups. But the advantage is that metadata is disjoint, resulting in, in good kind of compatibility. If we do fast pointers, the issue is that this will result in low compatibility due to kind of inline uh, inline metadata, but it can detect sub-object overflows. Um, both object-based and fat pointer-based approaches fail to protect against arbitrary casts, meaning that if you if you wildly cast between void and, and other types, uh, they will lose information. Right? This is an issue or a known limitation of the of these systems. So let's look at some policy differences before we go into examples of policies. So object-based policies store metadata, as in the size and the location for each allocated object, but no metadata for pointers. Pointer-based policies store metadata for each pointer. Now, a pointer-based scheme allows you to verify if each axis is correct for each pointer, because the, the metadata, the additional data is associated with each pointer. And you have to imagine this that like you have a very large table that is indexed by the pointer and gives you the bounds information for all of these pointers. For object-based schemes, you have the same, but for each memory object. Now, if you store this on a pointer basis, you can verify for each axis if the pointer is targeting the correct, uh, the correct object. For object-based schemes, you can only check if the, the uh, pointer actually targets a valid object, but not uh, the correct object that it was originally uh, referred to. Right? So object-based ones have much lower overhead, but they trade security for, somewhat, for the somewhat lower overhead and lower cost. So let me try to, to refine this a bit more with uh, the difference between pointer-based and object-based. So pointer-based systems store metadata on a per-pointer basis. Object-based systems store this on a per-object basis. So object-based systems can verify that a pointer points into an object, but not that the pointer was originally pointing to the object, because for that, you need to associate the metadata with each individual pointer. Therefore, pointer-based schemes are more powerful, but are also much more expensive in the amount of metadata they need, the, the cost for updating this metadata, and the overarching potential uh, like compatibility uh, issues that it will run into. Now, let's look at a, at a system that enforces memory safety for C and C++ by instrumenting uh, the pointer, so it's a pointer-based scheme. Later in the class, we will cover an object-based scheme that is used for, for bug detection, uh, namely AZEN. So softbound is a system that keeps metadata for each individual pointer. So in principle, softbound has a table, like a, an index uh, that is indexed by the, the address, or like think of it as a, as a hash map that is indexed by the address of the, the pointer that stores the bounds of this pointer. This allows it to, to transparently implement for each pointer uh, a lookup function for base bounds and, and check that the pointer is still valid. So this is a compiler-based instrumentation to enforce spatial memory safety for C and C++. And the idea is to keep information about all pointers in disjoint metadata. So it's moved somewhere in the, in the address space uh, the, of the process where this, this nice, interesting map is being located. Source code is never changed, and the compiler does all the transformation. It results in a reasonable, under quote, overhead of 67% of spec CPU 2006 when it was uh, evaluated. So let's look at an example. In this example, we've got an account ID of uh, three bytes 
an ID, the pointer that points to the account ID, and then an init function, and then a, a loop that reads uh, characters to update the, the account ID, right? Now, if we uh, add instrumentation or the compiler adds instrumentation, this would look as follows. Um, in the, the third line, the compiler would actually store the bounds as the, um, as the, the pointer is being assigned. And then in the account init, the bounds information would be propagated through a lookup into this magic, uh, magic table where this is being, uh, being stored. And then whenever the pointer is being dereferenced or right before it is being dereferenced, the, the check P, P base and P bound will ensure that the, the pointer is still valid. So this would allow the system to, to propagate the bounds to the object correctly and then detect whenever we are at the end of the, the account ID and would start writing into undefined memory uh, and uh, allowing the softbound instrumentation to stop the execution of the program before memory safety is actually be, being violated. Now, uh, the idea here is that softbound initializes disjoint metadata for a pointer whenever it is assigned. The assignment covers both the creation of pointers and their propagation, and then the bounds are being checked whenever the pointer is dereferenced. Now, this works reasonably well for, uh, for spatial memory safety, and there's a similar system for temporal memory safety. So temporal memory safety is orthogonal to spatial memory safety, and it only considers if the underlying memory object is still valid. The, the same memory area could be allocated to a new object. Therefore, we have to make sure that uh, pointer references to the new object and not the old object are, are still valid. And how would we detect stale pointers? Well, two options would be garbage collection and not to reuse uh, memory, but neither of which is, is satisfactory. Now, one uh, possible option is sets. And here we kind of leverage a version of uh, uh, an approach towards memory versioning. So each memory area will receive a, a version and each allocated memory object and pointer is assigned the same version. So whenever you create a memory, memory object, you increment the global version counter, you assign the version uh, to the memory object and then you also assign to the pointer. When pointer information is propagated, then uh, this, this pointer, uh, uh, this, this object version is propagated as well. Up on the reference, we check if the pointer version is equal to the version of the memory object. If it matches, the V reference is, is allowed. Otherwise, the, the version or the program will be terminated. There's two ways to detect errors. If the area was deallocated, um, then the version is, is smaller or the area was reallocated and the, the version is larger, right? So there's two different issues for, for failure conditions uh, where it would be uh, in effectively unequal to the, to the expected version. Um, the memory allocation is instrumented to assign a unique version to the memory area and the same version is assigned to the initial pointer that is returned from the, the allocation function. Uh, upon deallocation, the version of the associated memory area is destroyed and uh, pointer assignment propagates version. And then whenever you dereference, you check if the version between pointer and object actually matches. Right, so this works fairly well, also has a similar overhead in the spatial memory safety that is being done before and would implement uh, temporal memory safety for C and C++. Right, so unfortunately, neither the softbound spatial memory safety protection nor the sets temporal memory safety protection have been applied in practice, mostly due to incompatibilities with the, the underlying software. There's, it just doesn't scale to, to large systems and there's too many costs, too many issues and too many kind of corner cases in software. It makes it extremely hard to run on large systems of code. Now, it's an interesting idea and it will enforce potential memory safety to could enforce memory safety for arbitrary system if these uh, compatibility concerns would be would be addressed. This covers memory safety or the, the idea of memory safety 
and we've covered both spatial and temporal memory safety and we've discussed certain language aspects of, uh, of memory safety and how it applies to, uh, to, to low-level systems programming languages. Let's now also talk about type safety, which is an orthogonal aspect of, uh, of safety. And uh, a basic property is that well-typed programs cannot go wrong. And this go wrong, uh, Robin, Robin Milner means that they cannot do anything that they are not intended to do. Uh, type safe code accesses only the memory locations it is authorized to access. Different, then there's different type of, uh, different kinds of type safety flavors. Strongly typed, weakly typed, uh, the, where weakly typed do an implicit conversion. So for example, uh, Rust would be a, a strongly typed uh, type system where the, the compiler can complain about any kind of violations. Python would be weakly typed where you're running the program and just before it exits and prints the final result, there's a, a type safety error and the program will be terminated. Um, there are static and dynamic type systems. Uh, again, Rust, uh, Rust being static uh, and Python being dynamic. There's a lot of research um, that is being done, but despite a lot of research, people still use C and C++, which are not type safe. So let's look at the uh, type system of C and C++. And we'll focus a bit on the C++ here because C just uses an anything goes type system where all the casts in C are uh, unchecked and any cast in C is just an anything goes cast. Like if you cast an object in C from one type to another type, you're just telling the, the compiler that, hey, this memory area over here, yeah, yeah, it's now of this type, no longer this other type, right? But there's no notion of, of type information in the memory objects themselves. Now in C++, there's a notion of a type system but it is very, very weakly, uh, weakly checked. Now the two basic casting operations in C are static cast and a dynamic cast. The static cast does a, a compile time check and does not carry any kind of runtime type information. So the static cast simply checks if the, there's a, a pass in the object uh, in the type hierarchy between the type of object and the to class, right? So it searches for a pass in this, in this type hierarchy. Uh, for dynamic class, the actual, uh, the runtime system will execute an actual check. So at runtime, it will check if the type of object can be translated into the to class, right? Uh, so this is not used in performance critical code before, because it does an actual runtime check. So uh, a basic class is we have a, a base class here and we cast this ba base class to, to the greeter class um, in assembly will in the compiled code will load the pointer. There's no type check and it will store the pointer done, right? So there's no type check whatsoever. The compiler on the other hand during compilation We'll make sure that there's a pass between the base class and the greeter class. Now, if we do a dynamic cast instead, we would load the pointer, load the base information, and then call uh, a dynamic cast check to make sure that we are actually doing uh, a runtime check uh, and that there's the, the, run the, the type of the object at runtime actually satisfies the, the constraints of the, uh, of the dynamic cast. Now let's look at an example where, where we have a type confusion, right? Here we have a, a base system where we're using virtual dispatch, right? So we've got a, a base class that has a couple of fields and whatnot. And then we have an executor class and a greeter class. Both of, the, of these classes, the executor and the greeter, they extend the, uh, the base class, uh, implement uh, individual functions. So the executor class implements the function exec which takes a string argument and just executes system with this, with this argument. The greeter class, on the other hand, uh, has one, one function that says, or one method that says, say, uh, say hi, which takes a string and will simply print the string to the console. Right, and then you can invoke a greeter by calling new greeter and then greeter say hi, oh, hello there, and will print a, a string. Right, now a type confusion would be as follows, right? We have a, a class base, the class greeter, 
class exec as, as before. We create a greeter, we cast it um, from, uh, from greeter to base, and then from um, the executor E would be um, a cast from, from the B class to executor, both the static cast, both of them, both static casts will actually be allowed. Uh, we can set the, the location and we can call say hi with a, with a given string. And instead of say hi, we will actually, actually execute something uh, else. Now, the longer example, let's look at this longer example uh, in a bit more detail, right? We've got the greeter, the executor, uh, we do uh, a static cast from the uh, uh, to, to a, a greeter from B1, we call say hi, we then do uh, a second cast from uh, B2, which is also base, cast, uh, base class, say hi, but this time we say user bin calc, and this will actually invoke the, the executor function due to the, the, the missing check here, right? So this will actually trigger uh, a type confusion where the greeter class uh, actually references a executor class and the first virtual method in the executor class is the, the exec and not the say hi class and therefore due to the type confusion we can uh, we will call instead of say hi on the underlying system the executor function therefore resulting in the type confusion now to enforce type safety, we'll have to keep type metadata for allocated objects similar to softbound, right? And then check all the casts at runtime. So a static cast, dynamic cast, reinterpret cast, and static or, or classic C style casts will all have to be checked um, at runtime to ensure that they are actually referring to the, uh, to the right object. We've implemented this in hex type. Uh, which is a similar system that enforces, uh, similar to softbound, that instead of enforcing memory safety, enforces type safety for uh, C++. We do the instrumentation in, in Clang, uh, and then as LLVM passes, we add the, the instrumentation for object tracing and type hierarchy information, and then link it with a, with a runtime library to ensure that uh, all the type casts are actually being checked at runtime. Uh, as an implementation, we build the global type hierarchy during compilation. We keeps track, which keeps tra keeps track of all the the dependencies between all the individual types, and then instrument all forms of allocations and so on, and keep this this joint metadata for all allocated memory objects. Uh, we then implement a couple of uh, aggressive optimizations, such as tracing, uh, not tracing unsafe objects, uh, not not tracing safe objects. Sorry. Uh, limiting checking to unsafe casts and replacing dynamic casts with our check that is actually faster, thereby enforcing uh, type safety for uh, all kinds of casts and not, not just the dynamic casts. So to summarize today's, uh, today's class, security policies protect against specific attack vectors. There's a set of generic policies that we have repeated such as isolation, release privileges, and compartmentalization that build on each other and are best, uh, best together. Uh, and then today, the main focus was on the runtime policies, namely memory safety and type safety, which will uh, keep us occupied through the rest of, the co of this course. Uh, memory and type safety core bugs are the root cause of all the vulnerabilities. So the, the vulnerabilities we'll look at, the, they are mostly due to, to these memory and type safety bugs. Uh, and memory safety distinguishes between spatial and temporal memory safety violations for, um, for the, the low-level programming languages. We, did, we looked at softbound, which uh, enforces spatial memory safety using disjoint pointer metadata, and sets, which enforces temporal memory safety through versioning and disjoint metadata for individual objects and pointers. Um, type safe code then accesses only memory locations it is authorized to access we looked at hex type, which keeps uh, per object type metadata uh, and does explicit checks for casts. These are mostly sanitizers, as in they can be used during development to check if any kind of 
uh, issues have happened and are likely not used in production due to their, their overhead and potential limitations and incompatibilities with code. You should still use them in your code as you're developing the code and making sure it actually works and is safe. Thank you.